Welcome back to the second part of lecture seven. Now in our last examples, we showed when a set of vectors was linearly dependent and when a set of vectors was linearly independent. And there is a key observation that I wanna make here is that we've learned a new term about vectors being linearly independent. And if you're given a collection of vectors, say V1 through Vp and Rn, and you want to determine if they're linearly independent, it really, you can transform the whole problem into determining if a homogeneous system of linear equations has only the trivial solution. So let me just finish writing out this so that your notes are complete. So it's equivalent to determining if the following homogeneous system, so you make a matrix, where the columns are your vectors, V1 through Vp, and you're multiplying it by the vector x equals zero has only the trivial solution. So last lecture, we talked about homogeneous system of linear equations. And here we see that homogene being a homogeneous system of linear equations and looking at the number of solutions is tied to this notion of linearly independent. Let me just go back to a page here just to kind of highlight this fact that right here, we have a matrix and we're looking at a homogeneous system of linear equations to determine if these sets of vectors are linearly independent or dependent. And a key definition here is now we can talk about the columns of a matrix. So given a matrix A, the columns of a matrix A are linearly independent if you treat the vec you treat the columns as vectors and if they're linearly independent themselves. So kind of tying together a bunch of ideas here, we have that the columns of A are linearly independent. It's the same thing as saying that the augmented matrix A1 up to AN0 has only the trivial solution, which is the same thing as saying that the matrix equation AX equals zero has only the trivial solution. So just to reemphasize, linearly independence is the new word that we're uh, using or a new term, but you can rephrase linear independence in terms of a matrix equations and in particular a homogeneous system. So on the next slide here, or next page, what I have is kind of a statement about small sets of vectors and linearly in linear independence. So the question is, you know, if I hand you a set of vectors, can you easily determine whether the set of vectors is linearly independent or not? And so this theorem here kind of gives you some special cases in which you can say yes or no about linear independence. So the first statement says that if no matter how many vectors you're given, if one of those vectors is the zero vector, then the set S is linearly dependent. And let me give you a proof of that fact to explain why that's true. Let's say, suppose that zero is inside of my set S, which is one of these vectors. And we don't know which one it is, but we can relabel things to say that it actually appears as the last one, right? Zero is one of those vectors. So let's say it's one of the last ones. Then notice that we can take zero times the first vector plus zero times the second vector, all the way up to zero times the second last vector. And then I can take one times the last vector. Okay. But now all of these vectors are zero because I'm multiplying them by zero. And this vector here, because it's a zero vector, when I multiply it by one is the zero vector. So I'm adding up a bunch of zero vectors and I get equals to zero. But what we see is the weights aren't all zero. So I have a non-trivial solution. So it is a non-trivial solution. So S is linearly dependent, okay? So 
I could have had 10,000 vectors inside of there. I look in my set of vectors, I see the zero vector, then I know automatically that my set of vectors is linearly dependent. Okay, so let's go to the other extreme. Let's say that my set S here that I start with has only one vector. Now, if it's that one vector is a zero vector, part one kicks in and we know that it's linearly dependent. But let's say it doesn't have, isn't the zero vector. So you have one vector and it's not the zero vector. Well, statement two says that that set is automatically linearly independent. And let's prove why that's true. Okay, so in this case, if S contains only the single vector, then X times V1 equals zero and the fact that v1 doesn't equal to zero. So we're looking at this equation, x1 times v1 equals zero, and we know that v1 is not zero, then has only, has only the solution x1 equals zero, okay? So i.e. the trivial solution. So there's no linear combination of a single vector that will give you the zero vector unless you multiply it by, uh, by zero, okay? And the third fact here now tells me what happens if I have exactly two vectors, okay? So I have two vectors and they're both not zero because we want to avoid case one. So we have two non-zero vectors. And this one, is, this condition is saying that the first vector is not a scalar multiple of the first vector. Then what, it, what you have is that these two vectors are linearly independent. And let me give you a proof of that. And the type of proof that I'm giving here is a proof by contradiction. So how does a proof by contradiction work? Well, you see, I want my conclusion to be that S is linearly independent. So what I'm gonna do instead is say, well, let's assume all of these, but say that at the end of the day, I have the two vectors are linearly dependent. And what I'm gonna do is use the fact that it's linear dependent to get some sort of implications. And then I will show that those implications contradict what I'm assuming. So then, because I started with a contradiction and I got, or I started with the opposite of what I wanted and got a contradiction, then I, the original statement itself must be true. Okay, so let, let's just make this a little bit clearer by working out the proof. Okay, so suppose there was a non-trivial solution, a times v1 plus b times v2 equals to zero. Both uh, a and b, or a and b, not both zero. Or not, excuse me, not, both zero, right? So what we're doing is we're kind of assuming that that, they're, that these two vectors are linearly dependent. Well, if we assume, because it, we're assuming it's a non-trivial solution, one of the two, got, two uh, numbers, A or B, has to be non-zero. So let, let's assume that it happens to be that the A is non-zero. Well, there's two possibilities about the number B. If B is equal to zero, then what we have is the equation AV equals to zero, okay? Now, this number is non-zero, so a non-zero number times a vector equals zero. Well, that forces V1 to be zero. This implies that V1 is equal to zero, but this is not allowed. Right, because our assumption, let me just scroll back here, was that my vector v1 was not zero. Okay, so this can't happen. If a wasn't equal to zero and this guy was zero, then it would say that v1 has to be equal to zero, but that's not our, uh, our assumption. Okay, so what happens if b is equal to zero? Uh, 
or not equal to zero, excuse me. If B does not equal to zero, then we have that AV1 is equal to minus BV2. So I'm just taking this equation and rearranging it. And this then tells me that V1 is equal to minus BA times the vector V2. But this is not allowed. Right? And it's not allowed because we said one of the other conditions about my vectors VA1 and V2 is that one was not a scalar multiple of the other. So, V1 and V2 must be linearly independent. Okay, and we put our little square there to mean that we've reached the end of our proof. Okay. So here's the proof. You could look at it a bit and try to convince yourself of why it's true. The key thing here is this particular theorem tells us immediately what's kind of happening with small sets of vectors. So if you have one or two vectors in there, you can immediately decide what's happening. This ends our second part. Into the next part, I'm going to talk a little bit about the geometry of what linearly independence means. Okay, I'll see you in the next lecture, the next part.